Okay, well, I think we can go ahead and get started and wrap up the uh, digestive system today. This is not, <laughs> this has really nothing to do with the digestive system. It's just a half a brain. So, but uh, let's go ahead and start. Anybody have any questions before we start? Okay, then I'm gonna go ahead and open this up. And I hope you can hear me. I'm sure you'll let me know if you can't. And we're gonna start with the small intestine. Okay, now the small intestine is below the stomach. The small intestine begins with a structure known as the duodenum, that's the first 10 or 12 inches or so of, of the small intestine followed by a large segment called the jejunum followed by <clears throat> a smaller segment called the ileum. It's about 20 feet long, but it's called the small intestine because it is small in diameter. It's about as big as your finger, about your index finger. So it's about the size of that as far as its, its uh, diameter goes. And it goes from the pyloric sphincter all the way down to the ileocecal valve where this, the ileum and the colon come together. So this is a pretty poor representation of model of the small intestine, but this is, this is what we have in our torso model here. Uh, we're looking at it from the anterior side or the front side, and we can see a, a couple of structures here, or several structures. The jejunum is present in, the, in mostly in the middle of the small intestine, you know, the middle segment here, the duodenum is, is, is the smallest of, of the three segments. Uh, and it is the area from the pyloric sphincter out for about 10 or 12 inches. And then we move into the jejunum proper. So in the, the, the duodenum, that first segment, we're still digesting food material. The mesentery are the connective tissue layers that hold the uh, small intestine in, in its position to uh, allow it to be wrapped around itself like it is so that um, it can fit all 20 feet into a small space. Uh, it's just connective tissue layers uh, that hold all these organs in the abdominal cavity so that they don't all sag to the bottom into the, into the area of, of the bladder. If we flip the small intestine over, we would look at the posterior surface and we see a couple of openings here. First of all, there's the duodenum. And that structure right there is where the pyloric sphincter is located. So down here is the ileum and there is the ileocecal valve where the small intestine finally connects to the large intestine. And the, uh, let me go back here. Um, and the, a cross-sectional structure of the small intestine looks like this. We see all four uh, tissue layers, including the serosa. We have the uh, outer layer here of, of the serous membrane. This is the, you're gonna have the visceral peritoneum on the surface of the uh, outside of the small intestine. And then underneath that, you're gonna have the longitudinal and circular smooth muscle layers. You know, there's our uh, serous layer. That'll be the uh, visceral peritoneum. There are the longitudinal muscles and the circular muscles inside of them. That allows us to have peristaltic action, the squeezing of the muscle of, of the small intestine to push food or chyme through the, the small intestine to reach the large intestine. Inward from the, mus the muscle layer, we've got the submucosa, which is the basement layer for the mucous membrane that lines the lumen. This is the lumen down in here, the opening of the small intestine. And we can see there is the mucous layer. The small intestine is made up of simple columnar cells interspersed with many goblet cells. Directly behind the uh, this, the small, the uh, simple columnar cells. And you can see, you can see the, the shape of the columnar cells here. And if you look carefully, you can see all these little dark ovals are the goblet cells secreting mucus in here. 
underneath the columnar cells, we have the uh, capillary network. And the capillaries here are going to be fenestrated capillaries, much like we have in the glomerulus of the uh, kidney, where here we're not filtering, but we're absorbing. So as the nutrients pass through the simple columnar cells, they are absorbed by the um, by the fenestrated capillaries and then transported to the liver for cleansing and detoxification. So, of course, there's the lumen, the open middle of the small intestine, if you will. So, now, in the small intestine, food comes out of the stomach uh, in the form of chyme, that, that thick, pasty material that's very acidic. It's still carrying all that hydrochloric acid with it from uh, uh, the, the stomach. And so it's around a pH of two and it will enter the, the uh, small intestine about six hours after we start, after we ate, comes through the pyloric sphincter and then we act on it in the, in the duodenum uh, to break down fats and to complete the process of breaking down the protein. So we use pancreatic enzymes to break down the protein, and we use bile from the liver to break down the fats. So now the, the three regions of the small intestine, as I said earlier, are going to be the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Uh, the, du the duodenum is where we complete the process of, um, of, of digestion. And if we look carefully here in this model, you can see exactly, let's um, move to the other camera. Here we go. Now, move out of the way here. And you should see, here's the stomach here. You know, we, food has entered from the esophagus up here and passed down through the stomach. This is the pyloric sphincter here. And this structure here is the duodenum. And if you look carefully, you can see um, the edges of the duodenum right here. Let me see if I can zoom in on that a little bit. Have my camera around. There we go. Now this is the duodenum right in here. This green structure here is the um, bile duct coming in from the gallbladder. The gallbladder is up here in the liver. And the gallbladder's doesn't produce bile, the liver produces bile and stores it in the gallbladder. And then we release it into the duodenum when fats are present down in here. This is the pancreas right here, this long structure. We know what the, where the, pan, what the pancreas does for us as far as um, insulin and glucose. But the other thing that the pancreas does is it secretes pancreatic enzymes that pass down this white structure here called the pancreatic duct and dump into the duodenum also. And there we, we finish the breakdown of uh, proteins. The bile coming down, the bile duct joins with the pancreatic juices and the bile chops up fat into very tiny pieces. So we can see the location here very easily. And this model is a little bigger. See the, the duodenum very nicely. Let me put this model on. Okay, so here we here we see the here we can see our uh, the pancreas right here. We see the pancreatic duct and the bile duct here in green, and we see this is almost a scale for the, the full ten inches or so of duodenum here. 
because the pyloric sphincter was right here, the stomach would be up in this region over here, which, which is out of, out of the picture. Um, but we see that uh, initial, we, the final processing of uh, proteins and fats takes place in here. So this is the location of our uh, duodenum. It is on the right-hand side of our bodies, just below the liver. So let's get back to the discussion okay, now. So the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum, and the ileum is going to be used to help connect to the large intestine. Most of our absorption is going to take place in the jejunum. We're going to have the bulk of our nutrients absorbed there. Um, iron, however, we suck up the iron in the duodenum. Uh, B12 and bile are recovered in at the end of the ileum. Uh, water and fats are picked up throughout. Uh, sodium bicarbonate and glucose are picked up throughout but everything that gets absorbed has to go through those fenestrated capillaries and then uh, go into uh, the liver for detoxification. So the duodenum is the first region, about 10 inches long. It is retroperitoneal, meaning it's in the back of the, of the abdominal cavity. Uh, we have the bile duct, that green structure I showed you, and the pancreatic duct, the white structure, come together uh, and, and form one, uh, one duct controlled by what we refer to as a mouthful, the hepatopancreatic sphincter. And that is located, let me show you where that's located, right here. So can't see much in the, on the model. Uh, the larger model does it, believe it or not, does a better job. Let me show you on there. The, what we're seeing is the pancreatic duct is this white structure here, and there comes the bile duct, and the sphincter is located right there. And so we control the release of bile and enzymes, digestive enzymes, into the duodenum. When we have fat and protein present here, we, we trigger the release of that by releasing a hormone called cholecystokinin. And that opens up that sphincter for us so that we can go in and process, finish processing uh, nutrients. Yeah. Okay. okay. So here's our, our model. There's our duodenum. There's the pyloric sphincter. There is where we go off to the jejunum for the next 15 feet or so. Uh, there's the pancreatic duct right there. And we just get the hint of the bile duct here. It sort of dis it disappears at this point. Well, on this model, it disappears. Now you'll notice these ridges. These ridges here are called the plique circularis. The plique are folds inside the small intestine to increase the surface area. Here it's to increase the surface area for the complete digestion. When we get into the jejunum and the ileum, it is all about absorption at, the, at that point. So we increase the surface area to absorb. So the plicae circularis, these ridges have folds that stick out off the ridges. We call them villi. They look, villi means fingers. So it's like these little fingers stick off the, the plicae and then the fingers have fingers. We call them microvilli. And so we end up with this tremendous surface area in our small intestine. The surface area would cover, uh, if, if we could stretch it out flat, it would probably cover a classroom floor, maybe two, two classroom floors. It's huge. I've often heard it said it's the size of a tennis court if you could stretch it out flat. And that's because we want to be able to absorb these nutrients. So... So we increase the size. We can't do anything about the space we're packed into, but we can increase the size of the area by folding and then folding again uh, the, the, uh, the edges of, of the small intestine. So it looks something like this. These are the plicae circularis. These are the rings. This is a duodenum right here. 
All of these rings here are the pliques. The pliques then are gonna have projections coming off of them known as villi. Those are the folds, the fingers sticking out. And then the villi have micro have microvilli coming off of them to increase the surface area even more. And then within the villi, within the folds, the initial folds, because you got the ridges, you got the rings, then you got the villi. Within the villi, we have our capillaries and we have another type of vessel known as a lacteal. Now, capillary is part of our circulatory system. The lacteal is part of the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is a parallel circulatory system. What it does is remember, remember that plasma leaks out of the blood, out of our blood vessels. Our blood vessels are leaky. Plasma leaks out. It, is, it becomes interstitial fluid. We have to get that back into the plasma. We can't lose that interstitial fluid. So what we do is we recover it in a circulatory system known as the lymphatic system. Lymphatic vessels collect the interstitial fluid, bring it back to the blood vessels, to the plasma, through a duct, through two ducts at the subclavian veins. On the way to the subclavian veins, we run that, that interstitial fluid through our lymph nodes and our white cells are sitting in there looking for something to kill. And then after we've cleaned up the plasma or the interstitial fluid, which is now called lymph or lymphatic fluid, we then return it into our plasma at the subclavian veins right above the heart. So it's, you know, we circulate it throughout our body like that, you know, plasma to interstitial fluid, to lymphatic fluid back to plasma. And we use the lacteals to do that for us. Now, this is what we what kind of network we're talking about. Here's a villi right here. This is a finger sticking up off the plique right here. The microvilli are these little tiny structures on top of each villi. See, these are the microvilli here. They are folds, <coughs> again, in the membrane of the cells. Now, the, within the, each villi, you have a capillary network you have a um, that uh, goes up and down, up, you know, out and back in the middle of the fold. The capillaries are all going to be uh, fenestrated. And in the middle of the capillary, we have a lacteal. That's that green structure. The lacteal collects the fat, the fat that has been chopped up by the bile in the duodenum can now pass through the openings in the lacteal. And we will bring that fat uh, back up to the, it will be, it, the fact, the fat will travel through the lymphatic vessels and enter the plasma again at the uh, subclavian, at the ducts, at the subclavian veins. Then it'll go to the liver. And from there, it'll go out to the cells using the high density and low density lipoproteins. So, and so we're using both the blood capillaries and lacteals to absorb all the nutrients that are found uh, in the small intestine from the process, from the digested uh, food that we've eaten. Yeah. Okay, so that's how we get our, our nutrients. That's how we collect our nutrients. We uh, absorb them in the small intestine through fenestrated capillaries, and lacteals. So lacteals work on chopped up fat. The bile acts like dishwashing detergent. You know, to when you squirt uh, Dawn on uh, on grease or oil uh, on a pan in the sink, the the, the grease is going to uh, break apart into little pieces. That's what you know. That's that's the same effect that bile has on uh, uh, lipids in our body. It chops it up and it chops it up into small enough pieces that we can absorb them through the lacteals. Okay, let's talk about the pancreas. We know what the pancreas is. We've talked about the um, role of, of uh, glucagon and insulin in the islets of Langerhans. Well, those islets of Langerhans are sitting in the middle of another type of cell called the Acini cell. And the, the Acini cells are exocrine in function, not endocrine. 
the Yassini cells produce digestive enzymes that break up proteins. And the Yassini cells discharge their enzymes into a duct. So we have, a, we are, we have a ducted gland here now. The pancreas is both a ducted gland and, 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 and a ductless gland. It's, for its endocrine role, it's ductless. But for the exocrine role, it has a duct. It has a pancreatic duct, pancreatic duct that discharges these enzymes into the duodenum. The, uh, in addition to that, the duct itself releases an alkaline mucus here to neutralize the acidic contents of the chyme because the chyme's coming out of, this, out of the stomach still loaded with hydrochloric acid. It's very acidic. We don't want to burn our duodenum. So we release this acidic solution neutralizing, I mean, this alkaline solution to neutralize the acidic chyme that passes through the pyloric sphincter. And once those enzymes are released, we can break down proteins, we can break down any carbohydrates that have managed to make it through the stomach, we can break through, break down any other fats that we haven't chopped up, you know, and any other nucleic acids or anything else that's in there that we want to break apart, you know, any proteins, anything that's in, in the small, in the duodenum that we want to, we want to chop up. And that's what we do. So the, the digestive enzymes are going to come out, come down the pancreatic duct uh, and travel along with these um, solutions, these, um, this mucus that the, that, the, that the duct itself makes to neutralize the acids uh, from the stomach. And again, there's our pancreatic duct. You know, for reference, there's your spleen. There's the pancreas, duodenum, tail, head, body. And there is the main pancreatic duct. And over here on the side is the accessory duct right there. And the Acini cells are located all throughout the body and head and tail of the pancreas, releasing these, producing and releasing these digestive enzymes, which are transported to the duodenum through the pancreatic duct. Now, the islets of Langerhans are scattered throughout here making glucagon and insulin, they have no impact on digestion whatsoever. Totally a different uh, production going on here. So remember the, um, remember the islands of Langerhans? That, that's that pink structure you see here in the middle, right in here. Well, the Yassini cells are all the, the darker staining cells outside they're going to produce their digestive enzymes. We call it pancreatic juices, a liter and a half a, a day. That's a lot of pancreatic juice, a lot of pancreatic enzymes being released into the duodenum. It's to break down the food that keeps coming through from the stomach that we didn't finish the job on. We didn't finish the job. Um, we converted pepsinogen to pepsin in the presence of hydrochloric acid, and that starts breaking down protein in the stomach, but we have to finish it in the duodenum. We don't start absorbing nutrients, um, you know, uh, proteins and fats until we're in the duodenum. So now we absorb and we absorb and we absorb and we're going, you know, we finish digestion in the duodenum, we start absorbing we continue absorbing all the way through the, the jejunum and the ileum, and we get to the end of the ileum, and what we have left is chyme that contains mostly undigestible material, fibers, lots of fiber. We can't process fiber because most fiber is made out of the polysaccharide cellulose. Cellulose is, in humans, indigestible. So it becomes fiber, it passes through our small intestine and our large intestine, and it has a rather cleansing effect. So what gets, what enters the large intestine is fiber. Stuff that we, material we cannot process, indigestible material. The, the fiber is found inside a bean. Uh, the husk of wheat 
or rice or corn. If you eat corn in the cob, for example, the outer covering of the corn kernel is going to end up in your fecal matter because we can't process the outer covering. The yellow or, or white covering of the corn, it's got a high cellulose content. We, that cellulose is, you know, one step away from being wood. We can't process it. So it passes through. Uh, the, the outer covering of the wheat kernel is the bran. It's where bran flakes and bran muffins and whole wheat bread come from by having the, the outer, the bran covering uh, of the kernel uh, showing up in our food. We can't process it. Foods that are high in fiber, uh, you know, our leafy greens have lots of cellulose in it. We don't process that cellulose. Again, it shows up as fiber uh, in our, in our uh, heading towards our colon. It, the chyme goes into the colon containing material that is high in water content, uh, low in nutrients, and high in fiber. And the connection between the uh, large intestine and the small intestine is the ileocecal valve. And it, it, the ileocecal valve is found not at the complete, not at the tail end of the um, of the ileum, I mean, of the large intestine, but slightly above the end in a structure known as the cecum, the pouch. And the, so the ileocecal valve. Uh, allows the, the small intestine to discharge the, the chyme material into the cecum. And from there, it's going to get processed in the small, in the large intestine. Now, the ileocecal valve is located, let's see, uh, well, the, the large model has a pretty good picture, a pretty, pretty good illustration of it. Let me show you uh, here. Okay, so just for reference, let me let me uh, put this over a little bit and get it out of uh, zooming. There we go. Now let's zoom in on just a little bit. Okay, we're, what we're seeing here is uh, the small intestine and the large intestine is wrapped around the small intestine. Now the ileocecal valve is right here. This is where the ileum is coming in and the valve is this structure. Let me zoom in on it just a little bit for you. The ileocecal valve is right here. So the undigested material is coming from the ileum up through the last part of the small intestine and goes through this valve into this pouch. Here, this pouch is called the cecum. This is the ascending colon going up this way, or the, or the ascending large intestine. And the large intestine wraps itself around the um, small intestine. Let me see. There we go. Uh, and that worked okay. The uh, so so, and we're going to use peristaltic action to move the contents then in the small of the large intestine all the way up across into what we call it. This is the ascending colon here the transverse colon here, the descending colon down here leading into the, the sigmoid colon, the rectum and the anus. You also see here this structure right down here. Let me zoom in on that a little bit too. This is the appendix right here. The appendix extends off of the cecum. Now the appendix is not as is often characterized as a vestigial or useless organ, and it's not. We use our our appendix is uh, extremely important to us. It has a role very similar to our tonsils. Our tonsils are designed to become inflamed or infected to alert our immune system, and it, and the appendix uh, plays a similar role for us in here. 
the appendix, you know, we see the cecum, the appendix, the colon, the rectum, the anal, cal anal canal, and the uh, anus, and we see the cecum is below the ileocecal valve, and we have the appendix coming off of here. Now, the appendix has a role. The appendix may be a reservoir for bacteria. You see, a person who takes antibiotics for any kind of infection, you know, sore throat, uh, whatever, you know, sinus infection, whatever we take antibiotics for, any kind of bacterial infection, streptococcal, uh, you know, infection, a sore throat, a strep throat, you know, that those antibiotics are going to kill bacteria everywhere. It's not just localized at the site of the infection. It's everywhere in the body, including the large intestine, trying to clean sweep, kill all bacteria present there. Now that's not a good thing. You see, we have on our bodies, our own, what we call indigenous bacteria, our own resident bacteria. And if our resident bacteria is in place on the surface of our skin and lining the inside of our uh, small and large intestine, then pathogenic bacteria can't get in. We don't, you know, if there's no room for them, they can't find a, a place to, to uh, land on, essentially. It's sort of like the, the, the big thing about washing your hands with antibacterial soap or using a hand sanitizer. Antibacterial soap kills everything on the surface of the skin. Good bacteria, bad bacteria, uh, anything. And the problem with that is that it has a, creates a dead zone that stays that way for hours. Once it wears off, there is no, no resident bacteria anywhere close by that can migrate in quickly and repopulate the area with your own protective bacteria. It invites pathogens to come in and, and gain a foothold. And so we, we actually see the spread of more pathogenic bacteria if we use hands if we use antibacterial soap hand sanitizers only kill things for about 20 minutes they kill everything but only for about 20 minutes and they don't they don't leave this lasting dead zone and so it allows our resident population of bacteria to repopulate quickly so that we don't acquire pathogenic bacteria and spread it among other people now, in our large intestine, if we, if we are taking a course of antibiotics for eight or 10 days, we're going to kill everything in the large intestine. But our appendix serves as a closed reservoir of our, what we call the indigenous or resident bacteria. And once the antibiotics are gone, we can repopulate quickly from our own ba healthy bacteria that were present there to begin with. And so we um, uh, don't have to, uh, we're, we're not going to be prone to a follow-on infection. You know, we treated it as sinus infection. We're not going to develop some sort of uh, lower GI infection now because we don't have any, any bacteria there to, to keep, the, keep the pathogenic bacteria away. It isn't that they um, can fight the, the uh, pathogenic bacteria. It's just they fill up all the spaces and there's no place for the pathogenic bacteria to land and, and, and thrive. So it also, the appendix also may have a role with, uh, our, with our immune system as far as uh, uh, B cells and T cells. So uh, the, these B cells and T cells may become immunocompetent based on uh, uh, mature, maturing in the appendix itself. So to say the appendix is a vestigial organ that has no purpose is, that's old thinking, you know, that, that's, it's common to say that, but it's not true. The appendix has no very important role to play for us. Now, if the appendix becomes infected, then we have a, we may have a problem. If it, many cases of appendicitis may be treated at, with antibiotics and, um, you know, no surgery is indicated, in severe cases, then we need surgical removal of the appendix. The appendix is put there to become infected, to alert the immune system that something's going on. And we don't know how often that occurs. It's only when it becomes uh, a, a, an infection that 
the appendix can't control, then we have a problem, you know, because okay, how often do we, how often is bacteria expo exposed in the, in the appendix that might be pathogenic, but, the, but it gets destroyed by the immune system before we ever are aware of it? Well, we don't know because we're not aware of it. Anyway, so enough of my little rant. The appendix is not a vestigial organ. So here's our structure of the large intestine. It's about five feet long. It's about the, uh, the width of your fist across. We call it the large intestine, not because it's long, but because its diameter is much greater than the small intestine. The parts of the large intestine or the colon include the cecum and the appendix, the ileocecal valve, which you see right here, the ascending colon, which comes up on the right side, the transverse colon, which goes across the front, and the descending colon coming down the left side. In this space in between here is where the small intestine, all 20 feet of it rests. It's all woven back together in here. Then we go in from the descending colon, we go into the sigmoid colon, the rectum, the anal canal, and the anus down here. So the role of the small intestine is to absorb water. The, 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 the chyme, when it goes through the uh, ileocecal valve, is now on its way to becoming fecal matter. And what we want to do in the small intestine and in the large intestine is to absorb as much water as we can without becoming constipated or leave water behind so that we develop diarrhea. The line between constipation and diarrhea is very narrow. The average amount of water in uh, healthy feces is about 70%. So it's only about 30% solids. If we move a little bit, a percentage point either way, if we take out too much water, our feces become drier and they become more difficult to move. That leads to constipation. If we leave too much water behind, then the feces become, too, become much less solid and we end up with a patient with diarrhea. And so we try to maintain a 30% solids consistency uh, of the fecal matter, you know, and, uh, you know, a, good, a healthy individual will release feces that are 30% solids, 70% water, and that's what we like. We don't want to go either way with dealing with constipation or uh, uh, diarrhea. Lots of things affect that. Pain medication causes us to um, lose water. Pain medication causes us to lose water. An individual who takes pain medication uh, for chronic pain is often constipated. You know, heart patients that take uh, pain medication uh, for their heart uh, will often develop constipation. So these, you know, Different other different types of medications, maybe even some of the acid reflux medications, um, are going to cause constipation because their their whole basis is shutting down the release of acids from the stomach. But is it just shutting down the, the proton pumps, or is it also shutting down the production of fluids? So, uh, again, it leads to, you know, constipation is all about fluid levels in, in the fecal matter. Too much fluid, it's, you know, we go from normal fecal to diarrhea, too little fluid, we go to constipation. So it's, it's very important that we pay attention to um, the fluid levels in here. Now, so the, the purpose of the large intestine is to recover an adequate amount of water and get rid of the, the solid residues left behind, the stuff that's indigestible, also to recover as, many, as much sodium and potassium and calcium and magnesium as we can, as well as certain vitamins, as well, and, and generate vitamin K. 
the bacteria that live in our colon will process the fecal matter and generate vitamin K for us. We need vitamin K for our clotting abilities. So we have to get it from the, the, the processing of the feces. So now a couple of things about the um, large intestine. We don't have two smooth muscle layers anymore. We have uh, the circular layer, but we have the longitudinal layer uh, reduced to a band called the tinea coli, which runs around the entire uh, colon. You know, it runs up the ascending, across the transverse, and down the descending. Uh, we also see that the walls of the small of the large intestine will pucker into sacs. They look sort of like biscuits. We call them hostra. We also see that we have bags of fat that hang down from the walls of the uh, uh, large intestine too. We don't know why, but there they are. So it looks something like this. Now, this is the colon. This is looks like it's might be the transverse colon, but it's hard to tell in this picture. But here is the tinea coli. This is, the, this is the longitudinal muscle now running along the outside of the large intestine. That's all that's left of the longitudinal muscle. We see that that causes the, um, the longitudinal muscle cause, causes the sacs, the hostra to form. They're, they're puckers, puckering in here. And they do look sort of like biscuits, maybe. Um, and then these are the, the fat pockets that are hanging down here that we don't know why they're there. So, now, and if we look at the uh, model, we get a, a good appreciation of uh, what, those, what this looks like. Yeah. Here is. Here we see the uh, tinea coli right there coming up spread over here. Here we see across the top here, that is the band. These individual pouches are the hostra. I'm on the wrong side there. These are the hostra. And this is the fat that's hanging down here. We don't know what the fat's for. But it's there. But we do know that this is this is all that's left of the longitudinal layer of circular muscle, and the, the constriction of those the of tinea coli are what force the large intestine into these individual pouches here. Now this can create a problem for us. Uh, there is a condition known as diverticulitis that many patients develop over time. Um, Diverticuli are folds within the pouches and they can trap seeds and you know, small you know, you know, food particles like peanuts or popcorn or kernels and things like that, or even something as tiny as strawberry seeds. I mean, you know how tiny they are. Uh, seeds that get trapped or parts of seeds that get trapped in these pouches called diverticuli may cause inflammation leading to diverticulitis. And it's an inflammation, it's a very serious condition with inflammation of the uh, large intestine, a great deal of pain on the, on the left-hand side of the ab abdomen, uh, along with fever and headache, uh, and nausea and vomiting treated very easily with antibiotics and painkillers because the, they say the pain is incredible. Uh, and generally, uh, patients that have diverticulitis are advised not to eat foods with seeds in it after that. Yeah. So avoid peanuts, avoid popcorn, avoid even things like strawberries. People are asked to avoid that. Now, you know, so it, it's, a, it's a common occurrence in, you know, usually starts in middle age you know, and there's no, there's no clue that, you're, that your patient's going to develop this until one day they present and say, hey, you know, I feel terrible. I've had this horrible pain on my left hand side and in my abdomen 
and I've been throwing up all night and I've got a fever and I hurt and I don't know what it is. And, and it's pretty classic that it is diverticulitis. So anyway, now within the uh, uh, large intestine, we, we take a look at the cross section microscopically. We're not gonna see the longitudinal layer, but if we look at the cells, we're gonna see that they are nothing but uh, simple columnar epithelial cells, just like we saw everywhere else. We're gonna have lots of goblet cells here uh, because we wanna have lots of lubrication. And we're, we have a crypt-like structure that we've seen earlier, a uh, similar structure we saw in the stomach where we have all the various uh, gastric pits we see something similar when we take a look at the lymphatic system. We'll see a similar structure in the tonsils have these, uh, these, these crypts. Crypts are these long invaginations in the, the, the surface membrane here. And it becomes a, a, a place for bacteria to live and thrive. And what better place do we wanna have bacteria than the large intestine? And we have this nice, warm, dark, moist environment that's protected right inside the crypt. And so we see them surrounded, the crypts are surrounded by simple columnar cells that generate lots of mucus from their goblet cells. And, you know, it's, it's the ideal environment. And that's what we want. We want our own indigenous bacteria in that location to break down the, uh, the, the, the fecal matter to get as much nutrients as we can out of it before we pass it out as feces. Okay. Digestion that takes place in um, the large intestine, we have mechanical digestion as we release the chyme from the small intestine into the cecum. And then chemical digestion is the breakdown by bacteria. And one of the consequences of bacteria in here, you know, we, want, we want to have our indigenous, our normal healthy bacteria living there so that we can break down the carbohydrates that are not digestible, meaning the cellulose. Cellulose is a, is a polysaccharide, it's a carbohydrate. It's, it's long, long, long chains of glucose but it is not digestible like glycogen is. We don't use the plant starches like that. We don't, we don't, we can't process it. The best we, you know, we do have the, the ability to ferment through fermentation. We can break down some of this indigestible stuff and gain nutrients out of it. The consequence of that, of course, is the production of acids and gases, usually methane gas with unpleasant odors. Um, as I say, irritating acids and gases. You know, um, a person who consumes lots of beans, well, do I need to say any more? Or uh, high fiber foods. High fiber foods require a lot of fermentation to break down the fiber. And that produces lots of gas. So at the very least, you're going to, a person who eats a lot of high fiber foods will likely have a lot of discomfort from the bloating caused by the production of gases during fermentation. So it just, you know, it, it's gonna happen. Your patient needs to be aware of that. They say, I'm going to eat nothing but high fiber foods from now on. And then they come back a month later and they complain because, you know, uh, they're always gassy and they, they just feel swollen all the time. Well, it's because they're eating nothing but high fiber foods. So you, there, it is, you know, again, the argument for a balanced diet. Now in the colon, this is where we're gonna produce vitamin K and we're gonna produce a lot of our B complex vitamins. And remember B12 comes in through our food and gets absorbed through within, by intrinsic factor, but other B vitamins are produced 
in, uh, in the colon with our, thanks to our bacteria. So even though it's indigestible, we still get a lot of use out of it. And let's see. Uh, I think I've said this already. Let's move past this. And why am I going this way? Okay. Yeah. Okay, looking at our other model here, uh, you can see this gives, this is, well, it's not uh, detailed. Uh, it is pretty much to scale uh, here. The large intestine is only five feet long and about the size of your fist. So this is, this is really, um, this particular model is, pretty close to life size. It's probably 90% of life size. Uh, and so we see there's the ileocecal valve, there's the cecum, there's where the ileocecal valve enters into the cecum. There's the appendix right there. There's the ascending colon. There's the transverse colon. There's the tinea coli, the band of longitudinal muscle. There's the descending colon. There's a hostrum right there, one of the bands, one of the pouches that form. There's the sigmoid colon. There is the rectum. And then we have the anus at, uh, at the end here with the anal sphincter. Now, what do these look like on the inside? Well, uh, the most distinctive marks that you see or shapes occur in the middle. The ascending colon is simply just a, a tube, a, a wide tube leading up from the cecum. Peristalsis moves the uh, contents of the ascending colon. Uh, and we're up into the transverse colon before you know it. Now the bacteria live in these, in the ascending transverse and descending colon, and they're acting on the contents of, of the colon, whatever's in here. Now I will tell you, you'll never see any part of the colon look this clean ex uh, except with prior to a uh, colonoscopy because normally there is material in here, fecal matter that's formed in here. It's moving, it's working its way down towards the rectum and the anus. So this is, this is extraordinarily clean in here. Now, if you look at this picture, the transverse colon is characterized by a triangular shape. Now it does have the plicase inside here. Now the plicase are arrayed, if you look carefully, you can see it is almost a spiral pattern. So it almost is like as, it's, as, the, as the fecal matter is pushed through here, it, the spiral pattern tends to help move it along. But notice that the, tri the triangular shape of the tr transverse colon, that's very distinctive. We don't see that anywhere else. Over here in the descending colon, again, note the spiral shape of, of the plicates leading further and further down to the, towards the end of the descending colon. It almost, looks almost like the inside of a, air, of, of a vacuum cleaner hose with the, with the wire inside it. We know, you know what I'm talking about. That's because now the, the chymes, that are, I mean, the fecal matters are just dropping or being pushed along, it can follow this spiral and it helps to move it along through here. There's our sigmoid coal, again, cleaned out completely. You never see it this clean. Uh, unless your patient wasn't, was having a colonoscopy. If your patient's having a colonoscopy, you wanna see this. If they're not, then this is gonna be full of material, organic material, so. The rectum in the anus, the, um, the rectum is the end of, uh, uh, is, is just below the sigmoid colon. The rectum penetrates the, the anal, the pelvic floor, and now you're in the anal canal with a, uh, at, you have the anus. The anus is guarded by two sets of muscles called sphincters, an internal sphincter and an external sphincter. The internal sphincter is under involuntary control. We have no say over that one. We, we control the external sphincter. That's, that's skeletal muscle. We can keep the skeletal muscle contracted and close the external sphincter, not indefinitely, 
for, for, but for a very long time. It is under voluntary control up to a point. At some point, the pressure in the rectum will override the voluntary control, the contraction, closing the sphincter and force it open. So here's what, what we're looking at here. Here is the rectum up here and the anus down here. This is the internal sphincter right here. Involuntary control, it will close off the anus. The external sphincter here will also close off the anus. The internal one will open first, followed by the external one, if we let it come open or if it's forced open. There's the rectum. And the process of defecation is a parasympathetic signal. Uh, it's a spinal reflex. It will happen automatically. Uh, if the rectum, if fecal matter moves into the rectum and the rectum is distorted, it will trigger a parasympathetic response to contract the sigmoid colon and the rectum, relaxing the internal sphincter. In other words, we feel the urge to defecate. And we're, we're, the, the rectum and, and the sigmoid colon are swelling. There's pressure there. Um, we are sort of contracting the, the muscles around the sigmoid colon and the rectum and we're going to try and push the fecal matter out of our bodies. So, and as, again, we can control the external sphincter for a while. Okay. Problems. We can have obstructions. This is an obstruction in the ascending colon. You see the dark area there. What you're looking at is some obstruction of fecal matter, whether it's you know uh, some sort of collection of uh, cereal grains and nuts, whether it is uh, something that uh, became you know something that uh, enlarged, it, you know, it sucked up a lot of water and won't move now, or something that's too dry to move and it's going to move in its good time. But this is an ascending colon obstruction. And you notice how the blockage is here on, on the, on the left-hand side. As we move across the transverse colon, we see pockets of fecal matter trying to move out of the body. And particularly over here in the descending side, there you can see it right in there. Uh, it is very challenging. You know, it's a very painful situation you know, because this patient wanted to get rid of obviously the blockage and it took her several weeks to uh for this to all pass surgery wasn't required but it was getting close don't know what what the cause was it many things could cause an obstruction in here uh depend <coughs> depending on, on what um what your patient ate you know uh someone who decided they were going to eat you know, they were eating popcorn and I ate, you know, a couple of jumbo bags all at once. You know, you're at the movies and, you know, one bucket leads to two buckets, leads to three buckets. Maybe it's a long movie. Um, by chance, they may start, a, you know, if, if you don't digest it properly as you're swallowing it and you have the large popped kernels down in the colon, they may start forming a blockage. And then everything tends to pile up behind it. And so at the very least, you would have discomfort. At the very worst, you would get a blockage like this. So in the colon, we also pay attention to normal and abnormal growth. Uh, our colon will develop what are known as polyps, little tissues that grow, usually of connective tissue. Uh, it takes about... 10 years for a polyp to grow to about uh, two and a half centimeters. It's not very big. And so your patient has a colonoscopy. They would, you know, they would see this, the, the, the gastroenterologist would see these polyps and remove them. And then, and there were no polyps growing. So uh, your patient would be good for 10 years, because it takes about 10 years to grow a polyp to two and a half centimeters. It isn't until we get to the two and a half centimeter size that we start paying attention to them as something that may 
not will, but maybe, sort of maybe, possibly become cancerous. Still no guarantees that a polyp's gonna become cancerous, but it's safer to have them removed every 10 years than it is to leave them in there. Now, one of the advantages of colon cancer, if you're gonna have an advantage, is that they are very, very slow growers. So even if they grow for 10 years, there's no guarantee that they're gonna become cancerous ever. So this is the process of a colonoscopy. A large tube is inserted up through the anus, through the rectum, into the sigmoid colon, all the way around to the ileocecal valve. It has a camera and a light source and a cutting device to remove specimens and to take out polyps. And the whole process takes about a half an hour to go through and, and do this. Uh, and um, your patient is fully anesthetized while this is going on. Uh, and they'll spend more time talking about it later than the time they were actually uh, uh, under sedation. And let me, oops, I got carried away here. Let me, th this is what you're looking for. You wanna see a nice clean colon. Here's what you see when you have a lesion, a, col a cancer growing. But again, <clears throat> the cancers are very slow growers and they can be caught early. Now, colonoscopy, this is looking, you know, here you're, this, no, it's gonna repeat itself a couple of times. It shows you some polyps here uh, at the end of the, this segment. What we're looking into is the transverse colon there. And we go a little further along and we got a polyp growing right up. When it comes up, I'll point it out to you. There's the polyp growing there, and they're going to watch it. It'll pop up again there. And then they'll remove that. But this is a nice, clean colon. The person did their prep um, you know, properly, and they are, you know, um, you, you, the, the gastroenterologist can see everything going on. So thanks to the camera and the light source, and, and you know, if they want to remove that, col that polyp that, that shows up there, it can be taken out. So anyway, now, okay. The um, last two structures that we deal with uh, are accessory organs. They're not part of the digestive system proper. The liver, the liver, the liver. The liver uh, has no food passing through it prior to absorption of nutrients from the small intestine. So it doesn't pass through it directly. The liver, as far as digestion goes, uh, functions as the lar largest gland in our bodies. It secretes bile. Bile is not made by the gallbladder. It is stored in the gallbladder. And it leaves the uh, liver through the hepatic duct and goes to the gallbladder where it's stored. Then when we have uh, fat in the small intestine, in the duodenum, we can release the bile from the uh, gallbladder. So there's our liver. The gallbladder is about the size and shape of a little kiwi fruit, about the same color. It's green because of the greenish yellow bile uh, inside of it. Bile contains bilirubin and it's derived from hemoglobin. When red cells go to the spleen to break and get broken down, hemoglobin gets released and we, the, the hemoglobin is converted to bilirubin and is used to make the bile uh, in the liver and it is uh, stored in the gallbladder. And so we have this little pouchy, this little thing, the size and shape of a kiwi underneath our, uh, the, the ribs on our right hand side, right below the diaphragm, and it's green. It's, it's really is green. So, uh, and we will release the bile as needed into uh, the uh, duodenum if there's fat present. So here we see the hepatic ducts here and here leading into the uh, uh, gallbladder. Here we have the bile duct right here coming down. There is the main pancreatic duct right there. And we have a sphincter on each one. And now we, this combined structure is called the hepatopancreatic sphincter. So we release digestive enzymes 
and bile into the duodenum at the same time. So, and as far as digestion goes, it is all about breaking down fat, the fat emulsification. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> liver cancer. Um, <clears throat> liver cancers are usually what we call a secondary lesion. The cancers have spread from somewhere else to the liver. And it's usually that somewhere else is usually the colon. So this is why we also pay attention to uh, uh, the colon and colonoscopies and colon cancer, because the cancer cells can actually migrate, metastasize into the liver. Now this liver that you see here is about four times the normal size, because the average liver is about eight inches across. This thing is massive. All those structures that you see here are tumors within the liver. This is the gallbladder down here, and the gallbladder is about four times, you know, three or four times its normal size, too. Frame of reference, there's a person's hand right there. So that shows you just how big this liver is. Okay, so we produce the bile in the gallbladder, I mean, in, in the liver, store it in, um, in the gallbladder. We use the bile as bile salts to break up the fat and chop it up into pieces that can be absorbed into the lacteals in the, um, in the villi of the simple columnar cells. Gallbladder is green, the size of a kiwi fruit. It is triggered by the presence of uh, food in the small intestine. Chyme enters the duodenum and the enteroendocrine cells that are present in the duodenum, just like we had in the, large, in, in the stomach, those enteroendocrine cells, those are localized endocrine cells. They're going to release a hormone called cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin stimulates the gallbladder to contract and release bile into the duodenum. The cholecystokinin also tells the pancreatic duct to release pancreatic enzymes. So the endocrine cells, the, the, the localized endocrine cells inside the duodenum, when chyme is present, will trigger both the release of bile and the pancreatic enzymes. There's the gallbladder again. And you can see where it's gonna come in right down here. So problems with the gallbladder. Bile that accumulates in the gallbladder, if, it, if we are continually producing lots and lots of bile, it can crystallize and form stones. And the, the stones will block the bile duct. And so they won't get released when, uh, when cholecystokinin and say, hey, we got some food in the small intestine, let's release some bile and some, uh, some pancreatic enzyme to break it apart. Well, we can't. And so you get uh, individuals have gallbladder attacks. Here you can see, this is the, the, the gallbladder. You can see how green it really is. These are all stones in the gallbladder. It's been opened up after, as right as it's being removed. Here's one that's been significantly opened. It's packed full of stones. You can detect these stones very easily in ultrasound. So uh, if the gallbladder becomes inflamed, we call it cholecystitis. And it's carry, often characterized by fever and pain and nausea and vomiting and uh, lots of flatulence, lots of gas, uh, you know. So uh, an individual that's having a gallbladder attack for whatever reason, inflammation of the gall, the bile duct inflammation, inflammation of the gallbladder, the attack can, you know, characterized by a lot of pain on the upper right part of the abdomen. A lot of pain on the upper right side of the abdomen, maybe even on the right shoulder too. It will frequently occur after eating something that has a high fat content. And then it is either going to go away or it's going to continue. So 
we have acute cholecystitis and we have chronic cholecystitis. Uh, the um, acute cholecystitis is often treated very well with antibiotics because it's, it's an infection of, of the bile duct caused by irritation from the gallstones. And then it, uh, it usually clears up with antibiotics, but it may require surgery to get rid of the gallbladder. Chronic cholecystitis gives you the classic pain in the right-hand side with nausea, vomiting, and gas. Um, the, uh, the, gall, the entire gallbladder is inflamed. It's a chronic condition. And again, that requires surgery to remove the gallbladder here. So, and certain foods can trigger this. Um, cheeses, pastries, fried food, even chocolate can trigger uh, chronic attacks. Some people are sensitive to barbecue. Even smelling barbecue may trigger a gallbladder attack for them. The problem though with gallbladder, with chronic gallbladder attacks, the pain is hard to, pain alone is not a good uh, diagnostic tool because kidney stones will produce a similar pain um, as, as, you know, in the same, same general location initially, uh, ulcers produce that same problem. Heart pain, pneumonia, uh, and back problems will all produce pain in, some, in the same areas. And so you may, pain isn't always the best diagnostic tool to differentiate the gallbladder issue versus something else. And that's the end of our digestive system. Any questions on anything? Okay, this is also the end of lab. So we, we will have no more lab. The last two weeks of the semester, we're done. So you don't have to, there won't be anything uh, on Wednesday and Thursday afternoons anymore. So your afternoons are free. So still have lecture, but no lab. So if you have, don't, do you have, does anybody have any questions? Otherwise, I'm going to get us out of here and I will see you all in lecture uh, on uh, Monday. <laughs>